Uh, thanks for being here. Welcome to this event, who's been organized and, and uh, presided by, by the Institute of International Inequalities, uh, good jobs, bad jobs in the UK labor market. So thanks, first of all, to, to the Institute for inviting me to, to chair this event. I, I am honored to be here with you, uh, and of course, to be joined by Professor Kirsten Seinbruch, uh, Professor James Foster, and Sir Stephen Timms. Um, the audience here uh, at the Sayid Theater uh, will be able to make some questions at the end of the event, and also we'll, we'll be receiving questions from those uh, joining us online. Thank you for being here. So, uh, Kirsten, Shem, uh, Kirsten Sembrook is a, a British uh, Academy Global Professor and a Distinguished uh, Policy Fellow at the Institute of International Inequalities here at the LSE. James Foster, joining us online, is the Oliver T. Carr Professor of International Affairs and Professor of, Economic, uh, of Economy at uh, George Washington University. Um, and Stephen Timms is the Labour Member of Parliament for East Ham and the Labour Party's Faith Envoy. He currently also chairs the Work and Pensions Select Committee and is also the Prime Minister's Trade Envoy to Switzerland and Liechtenstein. So some housekeeping issues before we start. Uh, for those Twitter users, hashtag of today's event is at um, LSE, triple I, standing for Institute of International Inequalities. And we will do the question and answers at the end, but those online, please send your um, submissions for those uh, questions uh, as, as early as, as you feel like it. And uh, there's a feature at the bottom of your screen, so use that. And please let us know your name and affiliation, please. Um, some months ago, I had a conversation with Kirsten about multidimensional measurement. And um, I, was, I used to be a deputy minister of social development in Mexico at some point in time. And Mexico was one of the first countries to include that multidimensional measurement in relation to poverty. So it, it, had all, it has always been a really good anchor and a good metric to understand the different dimensions of poverty. So not only income, but in, in relation to our own measurement, how do we measure the lack of access to specific social rights, like uh, education, uh, housing, services to housing, um, food and nutrition, uh, health. Uh, so all of that creates a, a very interesting mix of elements to anchor public policy, to measure the evolution and the assess public policy advances, to be able to have specific policy interventions and, and uh, social uh, programs that, that have been worked, some of them better, some of them uh, less better uh, throughout time. But I have been on the ground using that kind of metric and using that kind of multidimensional uh, measurement, and, and it works, and it works very well, as I was saying, as an anchor to, to, to you know, understand the, 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 the phenomenon, but also to be measured against. And as it always uh, is, goes, goes along, those things that are not measured adequately cannot be improved. So I think it's an excellent uh, topic that we're understanding this uh, today in relation to the job market in, in the UK. So without any further ado, I'll pass on the word to Kirsten that will make a presentation and I will keep on following up with the next um, speakers and then at the end we'll listen to your comments and questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, good evening everybody. I hope you can all hear me. Thank you all for coming. Thank you Vanessa for the kind introduction and to Stephen Timms for being here um, and also to James Foster for being online. Before we actually start, the first thing I want to do is thank all the people I work with, um, people who made this event happen, first of all, but also my colleagues who co-author on this topic with me. In particular, Mauricio Pablaza, who is online from Chile with us, and Beatriz uh, Jambrina Canseco, who is sitting there, who has done a lot of uh, calculation for tonight's presentation. Now, since I mentioned the word calculation, I'm going to show you quite a few statistics and quite a few graphs. 
that we're going to talk a little bit about numbers. Um, but lest we forget that behind those numbers are people, we're going to start with a little video, which I think probably sums it up even better than anything I can say tonight about what we're talking here. So if we start with our little introductory video. the job to support myself. On a Saturday busy day, uh, normally I work 12 to 13 hours a day and I will aim for maximum salary possible on that day because I have to take into account my uh, car rent which is roughly around £160 a week. Congestion charge is roughly £15. Uh, I have to uh, think about the fuel costs and the insurance which adds up to roughly seven to eight pound an hour to run my car. And it's probably the same scenario for other drivers too. To make up for that, I have to do extra hours and extra, give it extra time. And it's pressure on the brain and a body at the same time. Normally, if I work in a busy hours, I would make less than minimum wages. And to uh, compensate, I have to work in quiet times, uh, mainly at night, so I can do the jobs in quicker times and maybe increase uh, the hourly earnings. If I work in the day, I would barely make minimum wages, particularly in London's traffic. You are not really paid much for being stuck in traffic because it's, I think it's 15 to 20% uh, per minute when you are stuck in traffic, which is, which is like five pound an hour, roughly, if you stuck for in traffic. Since the regulatory changes, Uber accepted its, uh, the drivers as employees or given employee status to its drivers. As a result, um, they give about eight to ten percent of holiday pay and about four percent of pension funds. But at the same time, it changed it, the structure of uh, commission fees. Uh, before, uh, there was 25% fixed rate commission applied to the fares. Now they're taking more of the salary from these employees as a commission than before. So uh, drivers are in a loss rather than in a win situation. Uber does say they will guarantee you making uh, roughly a London's living wage and if you make less than that, you, they will supplement it. But then before the regulatory changes, Uber used to count uh, your online hours when, from the time you were online all the way to the time when you were offline. Now what happens, Uber guarantees you that they, you will get London living wage. But when the time that's counted, is only the time that you pick up customer, drop off customer. The time you are waiting for another job, that time is not counted. So um, you will do 25 hours, but actually you've done 40 hours. So that's how they're able to tell the drivers or anybody that, that you're basically making average London living wages, but actually really in reality you're not. Even if the jobs are paying low wages, I still feel pressurized to take them because I'd rather be working than not working. For our job, we need a lot of fluid, a lot of water you need to take in order to reduce pressure on your body and your brain. And uh, in most instances, myself and other colleagues uh, don't drink a lot of water. 
I think the, the, the workman's conditions uh, can be improved uh, by providing some facilities where people can park freely for five, 10 minutes near where their toilets existing. And also, I think if there is some type of regulations introduced where a driver in an hour, on an hourly basis or a rider on an hourly basis gets no less than a minimum wage at least. Working for Uber is very precarious. You feel like your contract can be terminated at any time. Even a slight argument with a customer can end your contract with Uber, meaning you lose your job at any time. So you are constantly uh, under pressure to, to not make mistakes. Overall, to summarize this job, uh, it gives me the flexibility. It gives me uh, the option to rather work or not work. But at the same time, uh, I feel like somebody is taking advantage of me. Thank you. Well, um, I hope that was clear and um, a little sort of segue into uh, what we're going to be talking about tonight. So the first thing I wanted to highlight is that most people listening to that video will come away from it focused on the earnings and the fact that Abdul isn't earning enough on an hourly basis. But what I wanted to highlight, actually, is that he's really talking about three different things. He's talking, on the one hand, about his low earnings, certainly. But on the other hand, he's also talking about the unpredictability of his income, the stability of his income. And in addition to that, he's talking about other working conditions as well. So what I'm hoping that that video will, real, um, will illustrate is that behind the statistics, on the one hand, are people. We tend to focus an awful lot on wages, but there are other employment conditions that we have to focus on equally. So there are three key points that I would like you to take away from today's um, event. The first is, as I already mentioned, employment or poor quality of employment is about much, much more than just income or low income. So this is not something, my argument is that this is not something we can just measure with wages. The other issue, of course, is that employment conditions matter, other employment conditions, and that they often exacerbate each other. So if you are a low-income worker with other employment conditions that are precarious or unstable or you're working too many hours, then this, this is likely to compound a low-income situation, and we call that clustered disadvantages. The key thing, of course, is that we need to take account of this in our policy making, and to do that, we first of all need to define what a good job is, what is a bad job, and how can we measure this. So first of all, with regard to the definitions, there are many different perspectives of what matters in employment. We could ask workers, we can ask unions, we can ask companies, employers, we can ask governments. Everybody has different priorities and one of the reasons why this issue has, although it's figured a lot rhetorically on the policy making agenda, so we often hear people talking about generating more and better jobs, but really without a specific definition of what they mean by that. 
One of the reasons why this is talked about but not really measured is because it's very difficult to get social actors to agree on a definition. So I'll talk about that during the course of this uh, event and clarify who has which perspective. The other key issue that we have is that we don't always have the data that we would like to have. So the ILO, for example, has a measure of decent work or a proposal for measuring decent work that includes 71 indicators. I don't know of any country in the world that has data across the entire range of indicators. In some countries, we have more data on the quantity of jobs. Well, actually, in all countries, we have more data on the quantity of jobs. And in developing countries, for example, we have very little beyond that. So really, we have to make do with the data that we have or generate our own data. So that has been a big constraining issue on this topic, which is why I sort of would like to call it an infant issue, because we know an awful lot more about other social or economic phenomena. Um, for example, if you think about poverty, if you think about inequality, these are all topics where the development of data, the development of data sources, the development of methods has really furthered our knowledge about the topic. With employment and job quality or poor quality employment, knowledge is much, much more dispersed. So I'll come back to that point also during the um, event. Of course, labour markets are also a space where inequalities become manifest. So there are people with terribly good jobs and there are people with terribly precarious jobs. And if you think about the fact that we spend most of our time uh, working, most of our waking hours working, that really affects the quality of life of people in a labour market. I mentioned that the literature is very fragmented. Um, this is partly also driven by the data, of course. So we know a lot about individual economic sectors, or we know about particular issues in the labour market, especially wages, unemployment, and so on. We know about, uh, we have different disciplinary uh, perspectives. So for example, we know a lot from psychologists about what matters to um, workers. But this, this data often isn't linked to the quantitative data that we have on the uh, labor market that actually measures our unemployment rate or our uh, wages. So it's very difficult to connect different areas and the multidisciplinary facets of employment in a single measure and in a single approach. So partly what I'm trying to do here is to show you how that could be done. And as Vanessa mentioned um, before, you can't, if you're not measuring something, it's very difficult to change it. So for policy making, it's absolutely crucial that we develop measures that we don't, otherwise we just focus on the quantity of jobs or we think that there's a trade-off between the quantity and the quality of jobs without really looking into this um, from a multi-dimensional perspective that brings all of these aspects together. So, as I mentioned initially, this, is, um, this work is based on a whole body of research that we have done over recent years, and just a few sort of conclusions from this research. This is the first study on the UK that we have done that I'm presenting tonight, but we have looked at many other countries, including other European countries. And what we do know, both from our own work and from other literature, is that poor quality employment is associated with very much increased mental and physical health costs, potentially decreased education results for the children of workers who have precarious jobs. There's definitely a significant link between productivity and skill development and poor quality employment. It's becoming increasingly obvious that there's an increased fiscal cost that comes from poor quality employment, which is why in some countries central banks are beginning to worry about job quality. And linked to that also is the sustainability of our social protection systems, welfare states, and so on. So for example, if somebody is working informally or if somebody is not contributing to a pension system, that has implications for their future income and may lead to the fact that workers need to receive benefits even though they are working or have worked in the past. Um, and there are potential political costs associated with poor quality employment. Now this is probably the issue that has been studied the least of all the um, range of issues that I'm putting forward here. And then there's also the impact of new technologies or what is often referred to as the future of work, which where it's unclear which jobs are going to be affected by new technologies or by AI, or which jobs are going to be changed or lost as a result of these uh, issues. And in addition to that, 
how are our working conditions, which are part of a multidimensional measure of poor quality employment, how are they going to change as a result of technology and AI? So we know very little about that at the moment. So to sum up, if there's one image that I'd like you to take away from tonight's event, it's this idea that labor markets, even though they are markets um, where demand meets supply and vice versa, they are also the foundation of our socioeconomic structures, of our welfare states, of our productivity, of our econo economy. And if you look at developing countries, even the more advanced ones, and you look at their labor markets, you will see that it's incredibly diffic uh, difficult, if not impossible, to build social protection systems on a labor market that is informal, precarious, and so on. It's like building a house on sand. So that's the perspective that I'm taking for this approach. Now, in the UK, these last couple of years have been quite difficult in terms of the labour market and the post-COVID environment, quite conflictive. If you listen carefully to the interviews given by union leaders or workers in the press, similar issues arise that we saw in the uh, interview that we showed with Abdul. So they're complaining about wages on the one hand, but they're also complaining about their working conditions overwork in particular, burnout, having to do too many shifts, multiple jobs, and so on. We also know that there's an increasing proportion of workers who are receiving universal credit, even though they are working, or who require other benefits and support to support themselves and their family. That's an issue that hasn't been explored enough. We had a Taylor review a few years ago that made a series of recommendations about how to improve job quality in the UK. Um, Stephen will be able to tell you more about whether that was implemented or not. My sense is that, that it wasn't. And of course, in the context of policy making, employment is also incredibly important in the levelling up agenda of this government. And it's, I'm sure it's an agenda that will stay with us for a while to come. So overall, if you look at the concerns that come up continuously in the public policy debate, in the academic debate, there are some repeated issues. So one is employment conditions, um, skill shortages. There's a lot of talk about that. Labor supply shortages have been on the agenda recently. Um, that's sort of a newer issue that we have to look at. The future of work I already mentioned. And there may also be a global convergence of labor markets that's going on. So this convergence could be driven, for example, by the increased use of technology, the gig economy, the international gig economy, which is very difficult to track. Or migration patterns also change labor markets in very, very significant ways. So this is the context um, in which we decided to develop this methodology. Now, I mentioned clustered disadvantages. If you think back to Abdul and his working situation, um, he's probably, on average, between his two jobs, earning more than the minimum wage per mm. hour. Um, but if you have three different workers and if you compare their situations, somebody with a stable contract, although it's minimum wage, somebody who's earning a bit more but is working all hours that they can, and somebody who can't get enough hours um, and is probably also has the precarious contractual situation and a low wage. If you have these three workers, we can probably all agree that their employment situation is quite precarious. Um, now, the question is, who of these three workers is the most vulnerable? So that's partly what we are not measuring at the moment with the current existing measures of the labor market. And the method that I will show tonight is designed to capture this as best we can. And of course, the associated question with this is, how do we design, design our public policies? Are we supporting workers from the perspective of these clusters of disadvantages? Because my sense is at the moment that we support um, some families with wage benefits, others with uh, training, but these issues aren't necessarily linked across policy silos. So that's one of the areas that needs to be looked at in this context as well. So what I'm going to show you is actually a methodolo methodological proposal for how we could measure poor quality employment. This is not the only methodology um, that I will be showing that exists. Um, that I'm going to be showing you the Alkaya Foster method. Um, the Foster in the Alkaya Foster is Professor James Foster, 
who will be uh, discussing this, this presentation afterwards. Um, there are multiple ways of measuring poor quality employment, so I'm just going to show you one of them. The key issue that I wanted to emphasize at this stage is that this method is very much a normative one. So it's a method designed to help us or, or make us, oblige us, to think about what is a good job and what is not a good job. Can we, come, can we achieve a consensus on this? And if so, how can we measure it? Um, because, as I mentioned at the uh, early stages, workers, companies, governments, they all have different perspectives. And I'll come to that in a second when I show you what this uh, measure actually consists of. But first, I'll, first of all, I'll describe what we actually do. So in the Alkaya Foster method, the first thing you do is you choose the dimensions and indicators that you would like to measure and that you actually can measure given data availability. The key thing here is that you need to have data from a single source. So for this method, and um, actually to, to measure this issue of poor quality employment properly, um, it's not really possible to have data from the Labour Force Survey, um, other variables from ASH, and other variables from um, maybe an ad hoc survey on skills, and bring them together. You ideally need um, data from the same source so that you can bring the various variables related to a single individual worker together. That's the point. Um, that, that's the issue that allows us to compare workers in the labour market. We then define, once we've defined which variables we choose, we define their weights, how they are weighted inside this measure, and what is the cutoff line between what we would consider to be a good employment condition and a poor employment condition. So I'll illustrate what I mean by this in a, in a minute. Um, and the same thing also goes for the overall cutoff line. So I will show you in a second what this looks like, but if you are defined, if, if you are deprived in one dimension, of this measure that I'm going to show you, then we would consider you to be deprived overall. This measure of deprivation formally is called a headcount ratio. So the headcount ratio is what we mean when we refer to poor quality employment. But as I mentioned, we also measure cluster disadvantages, which is this combination of employment conditions that shows you how deprived a worker is. So this method also produces an intensity score that takes account of that. So are you deprived in one, two, three, four, five or more aspects of your job? The final measure is a multiplication of these, thing, um, these two ratios. I won't go into the detail and into the calculation of this measure. Um, that would be the final index, so to speak. But for now, in this lecture, I'm just going to focus on the headcount ratio because that's the most intuitive uh, measure. It gives us an idea of what percentage of workers is deprived overall and how deprived are they um, in each individual variable and dimension that uh, constitutes this index. Um, I just want to repeat, this is a normative proposal. So it's a, first of all, it's a proposal. So the next slide will generate many questions and we can debate it afterwards um, because the purpose of this is to suggest a measure that can then be discussed and where a consensus can be achieved about how we would measure this as a national measure. Vanessa can talk more about this as well. They had to do it in Mexico when they established a measure of multidimensional poverty. And of course, any such definition of a measure um, would have to be based on some kind of consensus. So what I'm going to show you is kind of the academic international consensus of what constitutes poor quality employment. Um, but data availability, of course, also restricts what we can do. So the overall structure of the measure looks like this. We have three dimensions, income, stability, and working conditions. So I'll start with income. In this dimension, we basically use earnings per hour, and we have a cutoff line that is two-thirds of the median hourly wage, and we use regional estimates to define that, which means that if the median wage in London is higher than in Northern Ireland, then you take the two-thirds of that higher wage. Um, it's a way of adjusting for the regional cost of living. We can discuss whether this is a satisfactory cutoff line. You could use, for example, as an alternative, you could use an absolute cutoff line like the living wage. 
but the living wage at the moment, for example, the one defined by the Living Wage Foundation, has a London living wage and a non-London living wage, and there are very significant regional differences that it doesn't take account of. So that's uh, the income cutoff line. When it comes to job stability, we are looking at the types of contracts that workers have, and we consider anything that um, is a temporary contract with a duration of less than two years, anybody who is subcontracted, so the salary is paid by a third party, anybody who's working freelance but is essentially employed or working in the gig economy, those workers we would consider to be precarious or below the cutoff line in this, in this variable. And then we also consider tenure because the literature is increasingly showing that even though workers may be changing jobs in order to move to a, a better job, um, when the job rotation level is too high, this has very serious consequences for the economy as a whole. Um, just before you ask, we did actually look at why workers change jobs. Most workers change jobs not because they want to move into a better job, but either because their contract ends or something else happens. Um, so I'll, I'll anticipate that question, but I can also explain more later. And if workers are very young, then two years as a cutoff line seems a bit much because they've just entered the labor market. So if workers are under 25, we use a one-year cutoff line. In terms of working conditions, we are using the survey Understanding Society, which is a household survey, a household panel survey. It's not designed as a labor force survey, so we only really have information on the hours people work, their pension, whether they are co contributing to a pension system or have one, and whether they have any degree of autonomy in their job. So there are, of course, a lot of other working conditions that we can't capture. And if you think back to the video where Abdul was describing his employment conditions, you will see that this measure by no means captures everything that he talked about. Now, no database does capture everything, and if you think about how many different employment situations there are in a labor market, you can't possibly cover those with a labor force, with a single labor force survey. So what we're doing is we're using the available data, the data that is um, considered to be the most relevant by the literature and by experts, and that we can work with also because we need um, the data to be reliable over time. So as I mentioned, these cutoffs are based on evidence from the literature. The other thing I wanted to talk about is the actual perspective. So if we ask workers, what do you most care about? What is the most important variable of these or other variables to you? They may give us very different answers. And if you ask a company, they may also give you very different answers. And I've even been in the situation where I've worked with uh, multiple ministries of labor in different countries. Um, they are often divided into a, work, a department of work and a department of pension. Often they have completely different interests and value or, or emphasize different priorities. And sometimes they don't even talk to each other about this. Um, and this is also reflected, for example, within the EU. So you will see country reports where uh, DG Finance is give, giving one recommendation and DG Employment is giving another, and they contradict each other. And then if you're the country receiving all these recommendations, well, what do you end up doing? So what we're doing with this measure is we're, we're based on the literature and what we know about job quality and poor quality employment, we are defining these cutoff lines ex ante from the perspective of what a government would need to ensure or need to monitor in order to ensure, on the one hand, productivity of the economy and the sustainability of the welfare state. But I'd be very happy to discuss that um, further afterwards if you have any questions for this. So just to um, recap, this is not a measure that takes into account the priorities of workers or their, um, the, it doesn't take into account, for example, um, how they would weight the index. So you can see here, for example, those three dimensions are equally weighted. A worker might say, but I just care about income. I don't really want a pension now. I, I want cash in hand now. Um, and we see that an awful lot everywhere, but especially in developing countries where most or many workers work informally. Um, and so they do prefer cash in hand now. But if I'm the government, I need to ensure the sustainability of my pension system of my welfare state, and I would want to prevent future poverty. 
So the perspective that we're taking here is that we actually do want workers to have a pension. We'd like them to have a stable job with a proper contract. We don't want them to work excessive hours um, because that has other consequences, not just for their own health, but also for their families and so on. So that's where this is coming from in terms of the perspective. Now, let's move on to some empirical findings. Those six variables that I just showed you, um, we have tracked them over time using the survey Understanding Society. And what you can see here is that they, the first thing you can see is that they move into different directions. Some are ticking up, others are ticking down. So just to clarify, if the line is going down, it means that there's an improvement because what this is measuring is who is deprived on a particular variable or indicator. So let's look at the pink line to start with, with, which is the one in the middle. That's how many workers are covered by a pension system. Now, this line is interesting because there was a pension reform that Stephen can tell you all about. And as a result of that reform, the proportion of workers in the UK labour market who are not covered or not enrolled in a pension system has gone down quite significantly. Other variables have also improved. The red line there, which is the sort of closer to the top, um, is income de deprivation. So as you probably may have heard, minimum wages have increased consistently over time in the UK, and this is a reflection of that. So the proportion of workers deprived in terms of their income has actually gone down um, quite a bit over time. Other variables haven't behaved so well. Tenure fluctuates a bit, but overall it's increased quite significantly, deprivation in terms of job stability. Um, over this same period of time. And there's a smaller uptick also in contracts, i.e. in the types of contracts that this work would consider to be undesirable. That's partly the effect of the gig economy, although in this particular data set we can't measure the evolution of the gig economy because it's a very recent phenomenon and not all surveys include information on this. So imagine you're a policymaker, and I, I present you with this graph. What do you do? How do you put this together? The key issue here is that, well, one, one variable goes up, the other variable goes down. Do I have more people or fewer people in poor quality employment? So that's what we're getting at with this methodology that I described. There's an aggregation method, which I mentioned, the Alkaya Foster method, um, that now can produce an overall indicator to show us how many people in the UK actually have poor quality employment. So the big pink bubble here, I'm going to move a little bit, is the national average. So overall in the UK, one in four workers has what we would describe as poor quality employment. Most of you will not be surprised to hear that women are more likely to have poor quality employment than men. I have yet to see a country where that is not the case. Um, except in the Middle East where women have better jobs, but that's because only the very highly educated women um, participate in the labour force. These are age groups. So the top bubble is very young workers. The next bubble is workers who are older than 65. And here we have other age groups. You can see that there are some differences there. The education levels and results aren't very surprising either. Um, the most educated workers, of course, have a much lower probability of being in poor quality employment. And uh, we've also looked at uh, skill levels and socioeconomic classifications. Um, there are no surprises in these results. So again, more qualified workers are much, much more likely to have a high quality job or to not be deprived in terms of uh, their quality of employment. And then finally, the last two pink bubbles are whether you are a union member or not. And again, it's probably not very surprising that uh, workers who are members of unions are less likely to be in poor quality employment. There are many other variables I could show. Um, but I won't bore you with the details of all of them. <laughs> Another thing that's interesting to look at is how this pans out over regions. So I mentioned earlier on that we are using a relative measure of income which adjusts for the regional cost of living, which is why this map might be shaded a little bit differently to what you would expect. 
Um, so overall here, London and the southeast come out with the highest share of poor quality employment in the UK. Um, that's partly to do with the um, income cutoff lines. That's where we have the most people underneath the income cutoff line. But when you look at individual regions, this is somewhat difficult to do because the sample isn't that big, um, but you will see that every single region behaves quite differently. So in some regions, for some reason, job rotation is much higher than in others. In other regions, pension coverage is much better than in others. And uh, you have to look at individual regions to try and figure out where this is coming from. Um, that's sort of one of the next steps in our, in our research. But just to give you the overall picture, this is the headline figure for every region in the UK, the proportion of uh, poor quality employment in each region, and then, of course, what we have to do is figure out what's going on and why. Now, coming back to Abdul and his story about not earning enough, as well as having other poor quality employment conditions, what we've done in this graph is uh, to try and show you how employment conditions and deprivations in this indicator play out. So if you look at the red part of the bar, those are the proportion of workers who are just deprived in terms of their earnings. All the blue bits in this bar are workers who are deprived in income plus something else. And it could be one deprivation, two deprivations, or more. And then there's a very lightly shaded blue at the top, which I'm not sure you can see how well you can see it. Those are the workers who have poor employment conditions in other areas, but actually are earning above the income cutoff line. So we put this together to give you an idea of the fact that it's not enough just to look at income. So if we looked at um, workers who are low earnings, yes, we do cover, that, that would cover most of the workers in this sample, but you're ignoring the fact that the workers who are shaded in blue are more deprived than those who are just in red. Okay? So again, I'd be very happy to explain that later if there are questions. Now, finally, um, we have a slide which on this large screen isn't very visible. I apologize for that. Um, okay, so what this is trying to show you is the, um, the dynamics of whether people move from a good job into a bad job, whether there's mobility in the labor market, uh, whether there are opportunities to move from poor quality employment into good quality employment. Um, now, what we unfortunately can't see here is that the blue bars at the top, those are the workers who are not deprived. The second bar is the workers who are deprived. These are the people who are out of the labor force. These are the people who are in unemployment and those who are in education. Now, what we do is in the first year here, we follow these people over time. Unfortunately, the years seem to have also dropped off in this graph um, as it's projected. Can you, oh, okay, sorry, I was looking from down here. Okay, so you've got the years. These are all the same people, and we look at them from 2010 to 2020. Um, and unfortunately, what you can't see here <laughs> is that there's very little mobility between these segments of the labor market. So if you look at all the people who are not deprived, relatively few of them fall into deprivation. Unfortunately, the people who are deprived, who have poor quality employment, are very unlikely to find a good quality of job. There's very little movement between poor quality employment, good quality employment, unemployment, and inactivity. Um, so th those are sort of the thin lines that you can't really see here. But in any case, the summary of this is that people get stuck in poor quality employment. That's the bottom line. So if you enter the labor market with a poor quality job, finding a good one and moving on from that um, over a period of 10 years is very difficult. Just finally, one, uh, one other slide, a bit, a bit of a graph. Um, this red line here shows our overall headcount ratio, so the overall proportion of people who are in poor quality employment. That's uh, what we've been talk talking about so far. That line actually, well, it moves a little bit, but um, overall it's relatively stable over time. It's improved a smidgen, but not significantly. The blue line on this graph is this intensity of deprivation that I was talking about. So 
if Abdul says he's earning not enough, plus he's got poor working conditions, plus his income is unpredictable and unstable, that's measured by the blue line. The blue line measures how many variables in this indicator are you actually deprived in. And that line is ticking up. So that means that the people who, are, who do have poor quality employment um, are more intensely deprived now than they were 10 years ago. Over this entire period, the unemployment rate has gone down. Participation rates have been relatively stable. So one of the things that we, of course, need to look at is how the quantity and the quality of employment or poor quality employment are related. Um, so far, in all the studies, especially the multi-country studies that we've done, also regional studies, um, there's not an obvious relationship at all between unemployment, employment rates, um, and poor quality employment. If you think back to the slide where I showed you the initial dashboard of each variable and how it developed in this index, one of the things that I emphasized was that minimum wages have increased, a pension reform was undertaken, and that, that, that has brought about an improvement in those variables, whereas the other variables which haven't been regulated um, over that period of time or where there hasn't been a regulatory change, um, they, they have basically been left to market forces. Now, this is a pattern that we've seen in every country that we've looked at. The minute that there is a regulatory change, th um, the quality of employment or poor quality employment um, jumps. There's a big shift. Um, and if there's no regulatory change to improve things, then um, sometimes deteriorations occur even below the radar. And if we don't measure this, of course, one of the big problems that you have is that um, you're not aware of these changes going on. So an anecdotal example of that is, for example, a government that I used to work with that implemented an unemployment insurance system, which, of course, requires workers to contribute continuously to the uh, system. It requires them to be employed on contracts, permanent contracts, stable contracts at least, and it requires them to... Um, well, it's related to their wage levels. And when this employment system, unemployment system, system was designed and uh, proposed, I said to the policymakers at the time that it wasn't going to work very well, it wasn't going to actually cover the unemployed because the people who did become unemployed didn't have the conditions that would comply um, with the requirements of receiving benefits. And nobody believed me until the system became operational and one year later they called me in to say, well, actually 86% of the people who have now enrolled in this system don't have permanent contracts. So I think we've got a problem. Um, and that's only when they, reali they realized, once they had the administrative data in hand, that the proportion of short-term contracts in the labor market, and therefore also the job rotation, was much, much higher than they had initially anticipated because their labor force survey hadn't asked those questions and um, hadn't been following this over a long period of time. So, conclusions. Very quickly to sum up, the empirical conclusions of this are that despite the positive performance of the unemployment rate, the proportion of poor quality employment has not decreased, while the intensity of deprivation has ticked up slightly, there are differences between how each variable in the index moves. Some go up, some go down. We saw the regional differences. So areas with the higher levels of GDP per capita are actually doing worse on this index um, as a result of the regional adjustment that we undertook. What we can now identify quite clearly is overall how many workers in the UK are in poor quality employment. We could look at subgroups within the labor market and we can start analyzing how poor quality employment moves in relation to other variables. So, for example, macroeconomic variables, unemployment, but also other variables such as job satisfaction or the receipt of benefits, health outcomes. Those are all, that's one of the reasons why we've used a household survey for this study, because we can now relate this outcome as a summary measure with these other variables, and that's one of the issues that hasn't really been looked at um, in detail. Um, the other key aspect of this study, of course, was the slide that didn't come out very well when it was projected, but um, workers are quite likely to become stuck in poor quality employment. So this is one of the key issues that policy need, makers need to think about. How do, can we help workers move out of poor quality employment into better jobs? 
Now, just um, to, to, to finalise the summary, um, the UK is not alone with these problems. Um, we see similar patterns across the EU overall. Unfortunately, there's no ideal data source at the moment for measuring this. Um, so one of the issues that does need to be improved very significantly is the kind of data we gather, how often we gather it, and which variables we include in surveys, or ideally even do this with administrative data. Now, everybody's already said um, if we don't measure something, not only can't, can we not address it with policy making, but we're also, in this case, mismeasuring our lives. Because if you remember, most of us spend most of our time working. So there's nothing worse than dragging yourself to a, a job that you don't enjoy. Um, probably many of us have been in those situations before. And it, as a result, also leads to many other consequences that we don't normally consider when we think about labour markets. So again, unemployment rates, participation rates, wages, they are all very good indicators of what's going on in the labour market, but they should be used in conjunction with other variables and um, other employment conditions that are very important as well. My suggestion is to establish formal measures of poor quality employment by means of a commission of experts in the same way that this has been done when we talk about measuring multidimensional poverty. And once we have the information and we have detailed uh, measures of this, then this can then be considered in our discussions of regulation and, um, for example, do we rely on economic growth to resolve these issues or are there parts of the labour market that should be regulated differently? Of course, there are many issues that I didn't cover in this talk, um, talk tonight. There are many open questions still. So, for example, why are UK workers becoming slightly more deprived? Why are they more intensely deprived over time? That's something that we need to look at. We need to look at the hidden costs associated with poor quality employment, so the fiscal cost, the social cost, the economic cost, both in terms of growth and productivity. We need to look at health and education outcomes in, re in relation to this measure. And also, we need to think about our policy making, whether they take account of these cluster disadvantages in the labour market, um, as well as looking at how, it's, how it relates to economic growth and macroeconomic variables. So with that, I will conclude. Hopefully, I haven't been too much over time. No? Thank you so much. Okay. Pass on to the discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kirsten. And I will pass on now the word to Professor James Foster, who is joining us online for his comments in relation to this presentation. Thank you. Well, thank well, you. Thank it's you. a it's great, a honor, great to honor to be, to be here. here. I, uh, I uh, particularly, particularly want to, want to uh, congratulate, uh, congratulate Kirsten and Mauricio, 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 Mauricio for their, for their very, very interesting, interesting work. work. Um, um, I also, I also want to thank Vanessa, Vanessa for all of her work her back in Mexico, Mexico in particular. In particular. Uh, we uh, certainly we worked certainly work on the multidimensional multi poverty measure there as well. well it uh, really was, really was a, a, a fascinating, fascinating time, time and, and uh, we so learned, we learned a, a, a couple lot from Mexico, from Mexico as to how poverty might be measured more effectively. Stephen, I look forward to meeting you and hearing what you have to say. Uh, hello, uh, hello everyone, everyone. I'm, James I'm James Foster. Foster. I'm, coming I'm coming to you today, to you today from, from uh, GW, GW, George Washington, Washington University, University in Washington, in Washington DC. DC. But as you but can as tell, you can tell I'm sometimes other places. Just this spring, I spent my sabbatical at uh, the International Inequalities Institute at the LSE. So it's good to be back, at least in spirit, uh, right down the street, uh, Houghton Street. So um, next slide, please. So I'm an economist uh, who also tends to construct indices. So right now, let me put on my economist hat and respond to the presentation I just saw. What might an economist say? Oh, the labor market is already rich in data. Why do we need another index? Multidimensional measures are too complicated. Why not just focus on unemployment, or on low wage jobs, or each component separately rather than combined together. Surely policymakers will not be able to understand this measure. How then can it impact policy? 
And finally, my favorite one, markets work. Why second guess using a paternalistic measure? So now allow me to put on my measurement hat and respond to myself. Next slide, please. First off, why do we need another index? Because the concept is very important and will only become more salient through time. Facts are needed to know where we are and where we want to go. Many questions about the facts can't be answered with the way existing data exists. It's in all different parts, not combined in a coherent, salient definition of what is poor quality employment. We can't answer questions that are very natural ones to think about. Who experiences poor quality employment? What are the trends? Are new jobs disproportionately poor quality, which would be a, a disaster? Where are the poor quality jobs? In which sectors? Which deprivations or disadvantages are the ones that are really making things bad for the worker? Anyone in business can tell you what has been said several times now. You can't change what you can't measure, and this is a powerful tool for effective change. Next slide. Why not use unemployment or low wage or some other individual component of this index? Unemployment rate measures quantity, not quality of employment. And in fact, it assumes that all employment has the same quality. Low wages are only part of the picture as we just saw. People do choose lower wages due to richer benefits and other characteristics of jobs. Most academics certainly recognize this. However, in general, the notion of compensating wage differentials is actually highly imperfect. Some jobs are simply worse in every component. Any independent component ignores others and misses the holistic picture for people. The multiplicity of deprivations is what characterizes poor quality employment. It's the multiple uh, attacks by not having high quality that leads to a worker to say, Oh, how long will this go on? Next slide. Can a complicated measure really influence policy? Well, let's see empirically. The same structure is currently in use in 40 countries with the multidimensional poverty index, the MPI. It's used to focus policy against poverty and it's based on nationally determined priority. Each country does their own thing in accordance with what it is important for that country. Experience shows that policymakers and citizens both understand it. Indeed, it becomes a tool for communicating with citizens the current conditions and the improvements. It's also a tool for coordinating. We saw discussions of different ministries not talking to each other in a siloed approach. Well, it has been used in many countries, particularly in Colombia, for coordinating within government across ministries, but also coordinating across government to the private sector and other stakeholders. It's also a tool for creating accountability, which can be consistent with the political cycle. You improve things, it shows, and therefore it's consistent with the political cycle in the time that is needed. Next slide, please. Finally, my favorite one, why second guess markets? Well, anyone who studies economics knows that markets only do what they're guided to do. Regulation, the setup, the rules of the game matter. All of those matter. And indeed, on top of that, policy matters. Government and civil society step in when markets fail. And as a result, monitoring and evaluation become key. Measures or indices become very important to see your, whether you're doing what you think you are doing. 
The main ingredients of success of an index like this will be from the potential political will of leaders. If a leader gets behind it, things will happen. And the expert consensus and social dialogue in a country, that will make it so that it reflects various ways of thinking about what poor jobs would be about. And in fact, if it's inclusive in the discussion, the more inclusive, the more sustainable that the index is. This approach is anything but paternalistic, embodying the society's goals and aspirations. Next slide, please. Well, that's only one economist's perspective. What do you think? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, James, for, for your uh, very uh, thoughtful and, and thought-provoking uh, comments. And now it's the turn to pass on the word to Sir Stephen okay. Tibbs. Thank you. Uh, well, I I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Kirsten, very much for inviting me. Thank you for that research. And thank you, Professor Foster, as well, for those remarks. I took the... Uh, Child Poverty Act through Parliament at the end of the last Labour government. And I'm very interested in the subject of, of measurement of poverty that you touched on in your uh, remarks. Um, so I'm the Labour MP for East Ham in the East End of London. Next year, I will have had that position for 30 years. Um, and for the last three years, I've been the chair of the Work and Pensions Select Committee. Uh, the committee scrutinises, on behalf of Parliament, the work of the Department for Work and Pensions. We look at the social security system, at the administration of universal credit, which has been uh, mentioned. Also, the work of the health and safety executive, because that happens to report to the Department for Work and Pensions. We do not look, in our committee, at wider labor market regulation, because the Department for Business is responsible for that. And so the separate business select committee scrutinizes uh, that. But Kirsten's research is clearly right that deprivation is not singular. It is not just low pay or long hours. It, it includes pension access, uh, in which my committee has a very keen interest, um, and workers' broader um, it, it, uh, autonomy. The government I was a, a minister in, the, the Labour government, uh, introduced the national minimum wage. Now, our opponents said at the time that would increase unemployment, but it, it didn't. We expanded parental rights. We introduced, it, uh, introduced a right to request flexible working, raised the compensation for unfair dismissal, and over two Employment Relations Acts banned blacklisting and uh, we provided a legal right to trade union uh, representation. Uh, in his response to the King's speech this week, uh, on, on Tuesday, uh, Keir Starmer, the leader of uh, the Labour Party, made the, the crucial affirmation that, and I quote, strong workers' rights are good for growth. Now, I don't think current ministers believe that. I think they belong to the school which claimed that a national minimum wage would increase unemployment. I think that must be the reason why, six years after the government accepted the recommendations of the Taylor Review, which Kirsten mentioned, four years after it was first mentioned in a Queen's speech, we still don't have an employment bill to clarify the status of people working in the gig economy. And there was no mention of that bill in the King's speech this week, so presumably we're not going to get it in the next year um, either. When it comes to the crunch, I think current ministers, contrary to what they sometimes say, don't believe in strong workers' rights. Uh, speaking in the, the King's speech debate in, in Parliament yesterday, Angela Rayner committed a Labour government, if one is elected next year, to introduce, uh, update, uh, uh, up, uh, sorry, to introduce an employment rights bill on, in its first 100 days. We've published in our party a thing called the New Deal for working people. Am I 
causing that problem, which uh, set out a, a program reflecting the multi-dimensional, multi-faceted nature of the problem that Kirsten has quantified. And that document opens by asserting we all deserve high-quality, secure, rewarding jobs. It commits to the, the use of public procurement to support good work, to the introduction of fair pay agreements across the economy, to, the, uh, to, to a ban on zero-hours contracts. There have to be at least a minimum number of hours per week committed uh, in the contract. It commits to a right to switch off and work autonomously, to updated trade union legislation, and to stronger enforcement of workplace rights. A single enforcement body, which was recommended in that Taylor review six years ago, that will be important. A lot of the laws we do have at the moment are simply not properly enforced. The Resolution Foundation estimates that nearly a third of low-paid workers earn less than the minimum wage, which is against the law. Uh, 900,000 workers don't receive their statutory right to paid holiday. The government's director of labour market enforcement, a person appointed by ministers, she's supposed to coordinate the rather unwieldy current patchwork of different enforcement agencies. She called last month for a single enforcement body and in her document setting out her plans, she said, and I quote, the government's commitment to my role could have been stronger. <laughs> Diplomatic way of sending the problems that she's been dealing with. But my committee, as I've said, takes a particular interest in, in pension access, which featured um, in Kirsten's uh, research. Last year, we published the report of our inquiry on saving for later life. We looked at the state of pension saving 15 years after Adair Turner's Pensions Commission recommended uh, auto-enrolment. Uh, we now have auto-enrolment. Any worker earning over £10,000 per year is automatically enrolled by their employer into a pension. The employer has to contribute at least 5% of your salary to that pension pot, and you, sorry, at least 3% of your salary and you contribute 5% at least. Uh, you can opt out, if you like, and not, uh, not pay your 5% contribution, but if you do opt out, your employer doesn't any longer pay your, the 3% contribution uh, either. In practice, opting out has been very low, even in the current cost of living crisis, when people have been so focused on uh, uh, paying the bills. Now, this policy of auto-enrolment was devised <coughs> under the Labour government. I was the pensions minister when Adair Turner recommended it uh, in 2006. But it was legislated for by the coalition and implemented by the Conservatives. And that cross-party consensus, I think, has been key to its success. The proportion of eligible workers saving for a pension has more or less doubled from 44% in 2012 to 86% in 2020. And that, I think, is what's reflected in that falling line we saw on the graph. But there are serious problems here. Our report highlighted, in particular, that people are not saving enough. 8% of your salary being, paid, being saved each year um, is not enough to get you a decent income in retirement uh, when you reach retirement age. Ideally, I think, the research that we've been hearing about should also consider whether this pension is going to be adequate as well as whether uh, you have a pension um, at all. And there are large gaps in pension saving which remain, as the graph uh, showed. One of the big ones is amongst self-employed people. Employer auto-enrolment has been very effective amongst employees, but there is no equivalent for self-employed people. So pension saving amongst employees, as I've said, has doubled, but it's fallen among the self-employed from nearly half in the year 2000 to just one in six 
uh, today. And people working in the gig economy, generally classed as self-employed, have not been uh, auto-enrolled. Now, as was touched on in the video earlier, a group of drivers working for Uber challenged their self-employed status. There was a bitter court battle over this. Uber fought very hard against the drivers. They, with the support of the GMB trade union, took that case to the Supreme Court, where finally they won. Uber was forced to give its drivers holiday pay and access to a pension. And I think the firm has uh, undergone quite a dramatic change of heart since that Supreme Court decision. Abdul made the point that it has not all gone in uh, driver's direction. But I think one crucial thing that Uber has done now, it has recognised the GMB uh, trade union. It's got a, 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 an agreement with that union. And I was speaking to the GMB last week. They tell me that very large numbers of Uber drivers are now joining the trade union. And hopefully, uh, as uh, one of uh, Kirsten's graphs showed, that will lead to, over time, a significant improvement in their uh, position. But the rights that have been won for Uber drivers have not been granted to drivers working for Uber's competitors. Uh, often, actually, the same people at different times of the day. The, the competitors say that the law isn't clear. The pensions regulator has been talking to our committee about their experience of getting, trying to get gig economy workers into pension saving. And the competitors to Uber say, well, the law doesn't say that these people are workers. Actually, they are self-employed, so they don't have to be um, auto-enrolled. En that missing employment bill is urgently needed. The GMB estimates that 200,000 private hire drivers don't have protections to which they're entitled, including a pension. And by the way, the protections haven't been granted to Uber Eats moped delivery drivers either, whose position is significantly uh, less good than the private hire drivers. Another important gap is that uh, people, typically women, who work in several jobs and earn less than £10,000 a year in each of those several jobs, even though altogether they earn more than £10,000 from those jobs altogether, those people are not being auto-enrolled because none of their several employers has the obligation to auto-enroll them because they're paying them less than £10,000 a year. We think our, our committee uh, said that ought to be changed. Uh, we, we think it could be, uh, and, and, and we think that it, that it should be. Working age social security is important, I think, here too. The committee is currently looking at the level of benefits. In March, at the start of the inquiry, we heard from uh, a group called Bright Blue, which, as the name might suggest, is a a, a, a right-of-centre think tank, and they said that unemployment benefits are now so low that people just have to take the first job they find. And they argued that this contributes to Britain's productivity problem as workers are increasingly poorly matched to the jobs they go into. It's also driving low-quality uh, employment. Employers don't have to improve conditions where there is a, a pool of workers desperate for any job they can get because the level of, of help they get through universal credit is so low. They end up, uh, people end up too often circulating between ill-suited jobs and inadequate uh, benefit dependence. Working age benefits are at their lowest in real terms for 40 years. There are very worrying reports that the Chancellor will cut them further in real terms uh, later this month. Uh, in an inquiry into employment support earlier this year, and I must say the Department for Work and Pensions does some good work here, supporting unemployed people into jobs, but we were worried by the focus on getting people into any job, no matter its suitability. We were impressed by the more person-centred approach we saw in a programme called Jobs Plus when we visited the USA in February. And I'm pleased that the DWP has now accepted 
our committee's recommendation to pilot Jobs Plus in, in the UK. So I think Kirsten's research gives us a really valuable tool, uh, not just to identify the existence of low quality employment, but also to measure its extent. It means we can compare the UK with other countries. I really welcome this work, and I hope a future government will make use of it to shape a policy response to these very pressing problems of poor quality employment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for Thank this so very much. interesting overview on, on the Thank UK uh, specific case and, and, and the nuances and what is out there uh, currently as, as the most pressing challenges. And uh, we've gone a bit over time, so uh, I will keep the, the questions uh, shorter than expected, but this opens up the conversation and you, I'm sure the Institute of in International Inequalities is open to having a, an ongoing discussion on this topic uh, in the future. So please, here at the theater, if you have a question, uh, raise your hands and I'll point it to you. In the back over there, please. I think there's a microphone that, that will go your way so we can hear better. Thank you. Do you think that UK firms are addicted to zero hour contracts? Should we take a couple of questions? Yes, let's do that. Let's take a couple of questions and then I'll, I'll give the word to our panelists. Actually, I'll take three. So the green sweater here and here, please, in the front. Hello, thank you so much for tonight. Um, my name's Maria, I work for the UK Baha'i Office of Public Affairs, and we're doing a project on work identity and living a meaningful life, and how those three areas um, kind of intersect. And I, so I get, my question for the panel is, based on what we're looking at and the experience of people that we've been talking to, it seems like there's, there needs to be a shift in culture that different social forces are driving specific kind of norms around employment and work and life in general that are kind of pushing in a, in a particular direction that laws try to regulate from the top down, but really there needs to be some kind of grassroots culture shift that puts some kind of like psychological and like moral framework in place that everybody feels the need to drive meaningful change and to uphold the nobility of other people in society that isn't necessarily going to be adhered to through laws, but actually needs to be some kind of like personal and collective culture change that needs to happen. And so I wonder like what your perspectives are on this and yeah, what that means for you. Thank you very much. Here in front, please, as well. Hi, I'll just, um, do you think it's advisable for governments to provide free counseling and psychotherapy sessions for employers and employees to improve job quality and to further enhance the economy. Thank you. Over to our panelists, please. Shall I start? Um, okay, so we're on a little bit of a time constraint, but I will try to be quick, and I'm sure Stephen has um, lots of uh, interesting comments on these questions as well. James, were you able to hear all of the questions? Yes. Okay, good. Everyone. Right, so, well. so I'll start with the zero-hour contracts. Um, so. It's not just about zero-hour contracts, it's about um, other types of precarious contract as well. These have all been instituted to make the labour market flexible and allow companies to adjust their labour so their, their, their labor force or their workforce to particular demands. Um, it would be very difficult to now go out there and say, actually, uh, we are going to completely eliminate any kind of flexibility in that sense. I don't think that's politically feasible. The point I really would like to highlight is if we are permitting employment relationships that are more precarious than others, and if we know that there are costs associated with such <coughs> employment relationships, the fact is that we're treating all employers equally. So, for example, if you have two re retailers, let's say for argument's sake, one has a workforce 100% on a zero-hour contract, and the other one has everybody on a permanent contract. They're taxed at the same rate. They pay the same level of contributions. So it's not just about flexibility. 
um, we can, you know, we can, we can help, help or we can maintain flexibility. The key issue is that the costs associated with that flexibility, especially when it affects workers' health, their mental health, um, and their overall work-life quality, that should be reflected somewhere. Or, alternatively, we need to think about the regulation associated with this. So it's not that necessarily um, there are many companies, no company would be able to focus only on zero-hour contracts. I wouldn't say that companies are addicted to it, but certainly I think that zero-hour contracts are employed often in circumstances um, which are not necessary. Um, in terms of the shift of culture, I completely agree with you on that. I think the key, one, one of the key aspects of having a measure like this is that it draws attention to the fact that there are many jobs that are of poor quality and that workers in those jobs are subject to these cluster disadvantages so they can be deprived in more than one aspect. And that certainly has an impact on not only on their lives, but also on how we consider the labor force. So having a measure like this actually draws attention to it. If we just talk about good jobs, then nobody knows what you mean. And it's a very vague concept. So we've had too many years of people talking about this from a rhetorical perspective without any specific sense of what this actually means um, and without a measure that, that, that follows it. Free counseling sessions, um, gosh, that would be wonderful. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure we have the infrastructure, we, we lack infrastructure for providing many services um, to, to workers that would actually help them develop their capabilities in the labor market. Um, I think counseling is one of those, uh, but there are also others to do with training sure. and helping workers transition from one job to the next um, that are equally important. So that's probably something that um, is uh, for the long term. What do you think? Um, well, uh, let me go through all three of them. I, I, I mean, are, are we addicted to zero hours contracts? I think some companies are addicted to zero hours contracts, and we want to ban them. Now, I agree with Kirsten. That means that does not mean that we should scrap all flexibility. But we think that if people are on a contract, a flexible contract, then those contracts should at least specify a minimum weekly number of hours which you are assured you will be paid for, not zero. And, you know, I've talked to people who've got a zero hours contract and they've had no work at all for weeks and weeks and weeks. And, and that's completely hopeless that if you've got a contract, then your employer does uh, owe you uh, an obligation to provide you with, with, with work and, and, and to pay you for that work. And so, I, yes, I think there are employers who are, who are addicted, and, and that's why we want to get rid of them. Um, I also agree very much with the points about um, culture change. Um, I was just looking, the, the, the document where we've set out our uh, new deal for working people starts off by making this point, that we want to be, uh, Britain to be a place where working people are able to enjoy dignity and respect in their jobs whilst being fulfilled, uh, whilst living fulfilled lives outside their work. That's the kind of uh, ambition that we want to, to set. And as you were speaking, it reminded me of the work of London citizens, and I don't know whether the Baha'i are involved in that, but you know, that, that's a really interesting model where large numbers of people in London from faith groups, trade unions, community organisations come together and reflect on the realities in their lives and come up with ideas for change. And that's where the idea of the, the, the living wage came from, from the work of, of London citizens. And I think there are other things that we will want to change in our culture, which people talking together about the, the realities of their lives and the challenges they face will, will come up with. And then the third point about uh, should counselling be provided, well, I, I'm kind of quite sympathetic to this. And, and in, the, um, uh, in our document, uh, we say one of the commitments that we've made is that Labour will put mental health on a par with physical yes. health in our workplace. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there is an understanding that employers do need to provide occupational health support, and we're saying that needs to be mental health support as well as physical health support. And I think the kind of uh, support you've touched on is, is exactly the sort of thing that we are increasingly going to need to deliver and more and more people are running into mental health problems. Uh, it's the biggest source, we're told now, by the Prince's Trust of, of young people not being able to get into work in, in the first place. And once they are in work, they, people do need support. And so I, I think we should. Um, I apologise that as 8 o'clock is here, I have to depart. But um, 
Thank you very much for the Thank opportunity you very much for to be with you this evening. I've enjoyed it very much and all the best for the future of your work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank Thank you, so, you much. so much for coming. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Jane, some thoughts, some reflections uh, around the comments and questions? Well, I'm just going to talk about question number two and say goodbye, goodbye to, to Stephen. Cheerio. Right. right, so, so uh, please have a look have a at the Gross Google. National Happiness Index and Report. It is, in fact, a way of incorporating a moral framework uh, within the issue of, of helping people to have lives that are flourishing. It was top down initially. The king said we should look at gross national happiness, not gross national uh, product. Uh, but the fact is, is it has percolated pretty much throughout all the country of Bhutan. And I think that you would benefit just by looking at that very interesting integration uh, into a framework that talks about human flourishing. Thank you so much. Uh, and I, I know we're, we're almost done with the event, but I will ask if you can give us a question from the online audience so we don't leave them uh, without, without participating, and uh, then we will wrap it up. So we have one question from Mary who says, it seems that Uber workers have working conditions similar to care workers who don't get paid for travel time or expenses. How widespread are these working conditions? Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so the Uber driver was just an example. In fact, we're looking at other sectors as well. Um, I, th I think it's just an example of the employment conditions that we, it comes also back to the identity and the culture shift. You know, we have created a new form of working through these platforms um, that is now becoming the new standard. And one of the reasons why I showed that little picture of the house build, being built on sand is because the risk of this is, of course, that it undermines our entire labor market and, and the structure of what we are trying to build, including productivity and, and welfare state structures. So yes, this is very widespread, in particular in some sectors of the economy, more than in others. Um, but the issues are, are the, you know, the story repeats itself across different sectors. Thank you so much. And as I said, I think this research and this uh, new measurement proposal opens up the conversation. So, so we're here at the LSE, Institute of International Inequalities. I represent the School of Public Policy here, also willing to think about the policy effects and the policies that we can think about in, in relation to this. So thank you for being here. Thank you for those uh, joining online. And, and thank you to the III for this event. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. Just before you all go, there are some policy briefs outside on a table somewhere, I think, um, that summarize some of the papers and some of the work that this uh, presentation was based on. So you can help yourselves. Thank you all for coming.